Hello everyone, this is Jared Beyer, uh, putting together some audio for this slides presentation on COVID 2.0 part one. So this presentation is a follow up from the previous presentation I did for COVID, uh, which would have been sometime in uh, early 2021. Uh, there's a lot of things going on at the time. Uh, and this is more of kind of an update of uh, a three-part series on what has gone on and where we're going to go from here. Uh, so let's start off. So COVID 2.1, 2.0 part one is how did we get here from 2019 to 2022? Okay, so that's a title slide. Uh, the next thing is attention active members. Active members earn credit towards LMHF wellness program part two. You must watch the video in its entirety and email Mia at her email address to receive your wellness credit. So again, like I said, this is going to be a three-part series. This is part one. We're gonna talk about how we got here. So kind of a history of what's been going on, uh, kind of from the follow-up from the previous presentation I did a while back. Uh, part two will be where are we now, kind of things that are going on nowadays. And with the new schedule and everything changing constantly, it's been quite a challenge to really keep up to date on things. I've been working on this presentation for probably the longest I have on any presentation because there's been so much new material out there. So I've been trying to update as much as I can. Today is February 18th, 2022. So I'm trying to keep things up to date as we go. And then part three will be what the future holds for COVID and, and kind of how things are going to evolve from here on out. First of all, I'd like to thank all the first responders, doctors, nurses, hospital staff, police, fire, caretakers. All these people showed up and in the face of, you know, some pretty impending things to really keep every, everything running. Um, I mean, there's more and more people that are, are keeping our country running aside from these first responders. So just thanking them and, and trying to work together as much as we can to get through this. So I just want to take that time to thank everyone that is, is pulled through and, and made things happen and keep, keep our country working as we go through this. Okay, the next slide uh, is about mourning. So we've obviously lost many people uh, during this last two years uh, or year and a half. Um, so it's, it's been quite a change for our, our psyche, our, our families, our, our society to really have something like this come in and, and our response to it and how, how we could have managed to this point. So we'd just like to take some time to mourn those that we've lost, family members, coworkers, you know, relatives, caregivers. There's been a lot of loss uh, that's been unexpected. So this is something that we're still dealing with and we will for the rest of our lives. Uh, the next slide is talking about my previous talk. So this, so the previous talk, at that point, there were no vaccines. There was vaccine trials and things going on, but vaccines had not been available yet in this country. Uh, so before the vaccines were available, we're looking at basic things, hand washing, social distancing, masking, as much as we could without, uh, you know, using or having a vaccine available for COVID-19. Uh, federal funds were allocated to increase the vaccine development speed. Trials were conducted and things were sped up quite a bit so we could get these things released into the public, making sure they were safe. Uh, there was an emergency clearance approved by the FDA, so that was just for a temporary use of these vaccines. Uh, the main three at that point were Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. And again, Pfizer and Moderna were the two mRNA vaccines, which had not been used on a large scale up until this point. Johnson & Johnson was using the old, old type of vaccines would be a deactivated virus uh, for your body to build up an immunity to. Uh, the interesting thing, that picture I posted there with the bat with a question mark and a person, that's an interesting point that I've done quite a bit of research on and trying to figure out the origins of where all this started and uh, some pretty interesting things that I, I've found. Uh, obviously, fact-checking things probably take more time than really researching to confirm because there's so much on the internet which is just not true. Uh, it's, it's more opinion-based. And finding the right information is, is quite challenging. So that's something we'll talk about as I go on in my presentation. Uh, the next slide is about novel virus. So again, COVID-19 is a novel virus, meaning that it is a new strain which has made the jump from animals to humans. It's something that hadn't been seen before 
in humans before, so that's why they consider it novel. Um, it's basically something that you know other animal species have certain viruses and things which affect them, which don't affect humans. So that's something that is somewhat new in that it made that transition and jump. And there's some interesting things I found out about that jump uh, that, are, are, that I'll reveal and, and discuss. Um, the other thing, obviously, with this presentation, it is very opinionated. People have a lot of their own opinions. Um, I'm sure there's things I'll, I'll discuss that people have their, you know, maybe don't agree with me on, but it's something I've tried to take the most straight ahead approach to discuss more from a science or fact-based information. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to talk about is that basically scientists for years use flocks of migrating birds to determine which viruses are moving around to different places because birds can migrate thousands and thousands of miles. So in that trek, they're actually carrying different viruses with them. So when they're looking to see what virus might be coming, they're actually going to track and test birds. And they've done this for years to see what, what viruses are moving and how they're moving. Um, obviously, bats are flying creatures. They're not really migratory, so they're not carrying it like that. So it's a bit different. But definitely migratory birds in the U.S. have been tracked because they'll fly between South America and, and the U.S., so there's a bunch of information that goes along with that. But one other thing that I want to discuss, which we'll get into in more detail, is the wet markets in China. So the wet markets in China are basically places where wild animals are caught and sold for human consumption. Some of it might actually be for the pet trade as well. But a lot of these animals that are taken out of the wild obviously are, are not, you know, they're carrying things that, that are not around humans. So they're humans are bringing these animals into human contact. Uh, especially when we look at bats and things like that, obviously there's a huge industry, especially the uh, cosmetic industry is using bat guano and droppings for different products. So there has been, you know, have been people going into bat caves and whatnot to harvest that. And there's all different types of, you know, bacteria and viruses that exist there that we usually would not go to. So if someone is going there and bringing that that stuff back into the public that can you know make that jump and create some some sickness um, so the next slide we'll discuss are the origins so we pretty much know that that this virus like most seasonal flu patterns they start in the fall and winter uh, 2019 in in the east in china so basically wuhan china the wuhan province is where they they've determined where it actually started from but the story that first came out was that it came from bats and that, you know, Chinese were eating bat soup and, you know, Chinese eat pretty, a very wide variety of foods and, and especially animals uh, coming from these wet markets. So that's where this, they originally said this was coming from. Um, but an interesting thing is that bats would have been hibernating at this time of year. So there's really that really is not the main story. So that was kind of a, to take the blame and kind of put it on to maybe an animal or an eating habit or something like that. But it wasn't really the true story. And really the truth has not totally come out yet. So there's still more to that. Who knows if we'll ever really know. I mean, it is important to try and figure out how this happened and to try to mitigate this before anything like this happens again. But again, the bats would have been hibernating at this time of year. Uh, the second story was that it came from a Wuhan lab as a leak. And we'll discuss that more in detail uh, because there is a correlation between bats and this Wuhan lab. Uh, I don't think there's anything sinister. I think it's just human error, which allowed this to actually get into the public. Um, I'm trying to keep this uh, presentation really away from politics because that's really taken way too much uh, directive in terms of who did what and when and where and blame and things like that. So I'm trying to keep this very much on the health and nature and science perspective and, and you know what's happened and what we can do to kind of mitigate these things and learn from our from this uh, this past you know this pandemic. We'll talk about the response. So there was a two week initial shutdown, which we were told initially would have been that's it, two weeks, we're good, we'll keep everyone away from each other. But now we're over two years or more. Obviously, there's been you know some let up and, and lockdown and things like that. And other countries have had their own struggles with this. 
obviously travel bans between international countries and, and, you know, things like that, trying to keep people away from each other because humans are basically bringing this stuff around, right? So humans are the, uh, the host. So the host is actually manufacturing because the virus actually takes over your cells and makes it replicate itself. So you're actually producing a viral load, which is going to make you contagious to others. Um, so trying to keep people away from each other is, is a good step. Trying to keep people in smaller groups and their families and homes is a good step. Um, trying to keep people on the same page is almost impossible as we've seen over the last two years. Um, so staying indoors and trying to stay away from people, social distancing, if you're in public, obviously businesses and schools all easily shifted to remote, uh, work and schooling. That was a really quick shift. And luckily we had the technology available to make that happen. Uh, within that, we've obviously had lots of supply chain shortages, not only because of, you know, where things were produced, but because they, you know, industries were shut down shipping and, and all that stuff. So we had a lot of supply chain shortages, which we're still kind of dealing with because of the backlog of things. But initially we have had the issues with toilet paper, hand sanitizer, Clorox wipes were almost impossible to get. Certain food items were very tough to find. Uh, people were hoarding a lot of different foods. Medicines would be a big thing because actually a lot of medicines are made in India and China. So if we're not really getting those things produced and or delivered, we're actually at risk of not having them. Uh, and then obviously tons of consumer products where we just couldn't get things. I mean, you could almost get anything on Amazon before this. And then during this, I mean, you just couldn't get things. And there was all types of issues, which obviously still continue to this day. Okay, the next slide, we're going to talk about the spread. So obviously this spread very quickly around the world, even though, uh, you know, we shut down international travel pretty quickly, it's still you know, through cruise ships and everything going around, people coming home from being out of the country, things just happened that, that you know, spread this very, very quickly around the country. So again, I, I discussed about a bit about the bats in the Wuhan lab. So this is more kind of focused on, on what really potentially happened there. And these are quality uh, resources I found. So there was an NPR story, which is an, uh, an investigative reporter actually went into tried to break down more of what happened. So actually in 2016, it was a bat cave where they collected viruses because some people had gone into the cave to collect guano. And I believe the initial two people died pretty quickly and a couple other people got sick. I'm not sure if they actually survived, uh, but the this. So after that, there was, a, there was an outbreak of this virus in that bat cave and basically this this wuhan research lab actually went and collected some of that virus so they brought it back to their lab and basically they they set this virus up as being a level two virus i guess they have up to th level three being the most dangerous so this is considered maybe moderately dangerous but in this uh lab they actually they have a catalog of lots of different viruses and they do research on how to either make them more or less contagious, meaning ways that they could fight them um, to develop different drugs and things, not to use them as, as weapons and things like that. They weren't trying to weaponize this stuff. This is what happens with most viruses. And they, they do testing on it to see how it works, how they can kind of you know figure out and reverse engineer how these things work. So in case there is an issue, they would have a solution to, to fight it. So that's kind of what they had done. But apparently some of the workers that were working with this virus in 2019 got sick. They were not being careful. They got sick and they had to go to a hospital. Now, obviously the hospital is in the public. It's not in the lab. And those would be what we would consider patient zero. So this would be more of a human error. So this is more likely what happened uh, as soon as this, this you know, information started to come out, the catalog of the viruses that that lab had dropped offline. So trying to block any potential risk of liability, that lab's uh, virus catalog, I believe it's still offline. So obviously creating a, a situation potentially through human error that created this amount of not only you know, human loss and sickness, but also the financial impact of these things could be very damning. So 
there's, you know, there's things that had to be, uh, you know, hidden, I would say. So again, we don't know, and obviously we're dealing with the aftermath of this, but this is most likely the, the really what happened. So this, in my opinion, would probably be the most likely thing, because again, the initial thing saying that came from bats and the wet markets really doesn't, doesn't make sense, considering the timing and whatnot. Okay, on the next slide, we'll talk about social distancing. So as we started to create this distance between people, these stay home orders and staying six feet from people, we want to figure out how well did this work? Well, number one, it definitely slowed the spread because again, humans are hosts. However, this virus is pretty sneaky in the fact that you are actually contagious when you don't feel any symptoms. So if you're asymptomatic and you're, you're going to work or going around people, that was the really the, the problem is that you didn't feel sick. So you didn't think you had to stay away from people. And that's what created a lot of our issues. So, you know, people would go to a party, they would feel fine or go around other people. They would be contagious. They would pass it. And then those people, since they didn't feel, you know, sick at all, they would go home and, you know, possibly pass it to, uh, you know, someone that was at risk. So it was very different than a common flu. Whereas if, if you were getting sick, and you didn't feel well, you'd probably stay home from work for a couple of days and, and stay away. Whereas the problem with this virus is you didn't really have that lead time. You didn't, you were actually contagious and sick without even knowing it. So it was really kind of a stealth approach to this virus, which is really interesting. Um, but again, companies shifted quite quickly to remote work. It was lucky we had the technology available to do that. Uh, reduced capacity at restaurants, affected businesses, Many shifted to a pickup type business, but obviously we know that a lot of small businesses really hurt during this time. The big companies like Amazon, all these delivery services did very well because people were, were shifting to that. Obviously Netflix did very well because people are home watching all this stuff. So again, social distancing works, but there's other things that would be happening. So <clears throat> by shifting to this, at home type work, we really reduce that person to person contact. However, obviously we have to go out in public and do things and, and yeah, there's plenty of people not wearing masks that were contagious. There's plenty of people with masks that may have been contagious. We don't really know at this point. Okay. The next slide we'll talk about cleaning. Now this was a huge thing and it has been for most uh, flus and things like that, where just washing your hands can really help with colds and flus. And it does. Um, People jumped right back to hand sanitizer, and that that was another thing that there were major shortage of. I know locally there were some breweries that, that made it because it's apparently a very simple process to make hand, hand sanitizer, so they reworked their, their uh, production to actually produce hand sanitizer. One of the big things if you look at hand sanitizer is it actually dries out your skin. So when we look at our body's natural defenses against you know, bacteria and viruses, we have, we have our own defenses. So one of the negative things which happens with hand sanitizer actually reduces your our natural protective oils on our hands to keep that stuff from getting into our cells. Now, obviously COVID is, is a respiratory illness, so it's going to be getting in through your lungs. It's not going to go like right through your skin. But when we're using these, a lot of Sanitizer are actually affecting our microbiome. So it's creating issues where it's killing off, let's say, good bacteria and oils, which help protect us. And it's creating more of this antibiotic or anti sanitizer resistant bacteria and viruses that, you know, create issues and health, and health issues. So one of the things to look at as well with antibacterial soaps, antibiotics, these are, these are killing a lot of symbiotic. Uh, organisms which actually help keep us healthy. So that's one of the big things is you don't really see doctors prescribing many antibiotics anymore. I mean, I we were at the doctor recently and they actually had a sign saying antibiotics do not work against viruses, which has been known for years, but people just think they need something to help their body fight something off. Uh, the other thing we still saw a lot of were air purifiers being used in different chemicals in the air to try and kill these viruses. And again, this might be creating more super bugs, might be creating more issue. 
Uh, our bodies can can really fight things pretty well if if we give our bodies what they need to to protect ourselves. So unfortunately, this is a matter of science trying to to work against nature. So nature is nature doesn't care. Nature is going to do what it does, and nature is going to modify and mutate and change, just like this virus has. So as humans, we're trying to clean these things and make things really clean. When in actuality, homes are very dirty. The air inside a home with ducts and all these things, and and you know. There's a lot of things in the house that are that are not clean. Whether you clean your house or not, using a lot of different chemicals and things isn't necessarily the best way. So there's been a lot of movement towards more natural cleaners versus these harsh chemicals, which are going to kill a lot of good bacteria as well as some of the bad, but also could create these issues with superbugs. Now, if we look at masks, masks have been effective and ineffective. The main reason. I would say is because people don't wear them right. We've all seen people that either have a mask not covering their nose or mouth. Uh, there's too much space. You see people with these, you know, plastic shields which do nothing because the air goes right behind them. Um, there's a lot of different things that, you know, people when you give them some guidance maybe take it the wrong way or just say they don't need that or it's blocking oxygen. If we look at the whole blocking or lack of oxygen debate, that makes no sense. If you look at a dentist or a nurse or a doctor, they're wearing uh, masks all the time, and they're not complaining or having any issues with lack of oxygen. Uh, the issue could be if you wear the mask all the time. You don't really need to do that. I mean, I've, as most of you have probably seen people driving cars by themselves with a mask on or walking outside in public with a mask on with, when no one's around. I mean, those are not things you really need to be doing. However, if, if you're wearing a mask, you're going to block, if it's the right type of mask, you're going to block certain bacteria and viruses. I'm sure the amount of colds and, and basic fluids have really dropped off because people are, are not around each other and wearing masks. So really, it's, it's a matter of wearing them properly and when you need to wear them, not all the time. So, you know, in, at one point they said you have to cover your mask with, or your face with some type of cloth. It doesn't have to be a, a, a real mask. And if you can smell through it, a fabric, viruses are much smaller than, than scent molecules. So they're going right through that. Um, also, when you're breathing on the inside of a mask, you're creating a moist environment, which is where those kind of things grow well, especially bacteria. Um, and the main thing is it's, it's just got to be worn the right way. The other thing is all these disposable masks, masks, I mean, the amount of litter and garbage we see is just remarkable. It's just, it's really disgusting. People do not clean up after themselves in this country. Okay, the next slide is about human hosts. Uh, those three hosts there are funny guys. I just thought that was a good picture. But basically, again, this is a matter of nature versus science. All these things in nature are things that scientists are trying to study and figure out. However, the big thing in nature is we don't always get it all. Like when we're trying to, to figure out how this, this virus or this bacteria works, you might find some things, but there's a lot in life that we just we're making assumptions on, right? So it's a scientific theory. Uh, science is great when we, when we trust it and it works, but there's always little things that we maybe miss and we don't understand. Uh, again, this is a respiratory virus. There's a lot of talk about, oh, this might not be this or that. It's a respiratory virus. That's how it's getting in your body. Um, certain people, though, actually uh, maybe just had COVID without really knowing what if they had it or not and actually had more digestive issues. So there was a huge list of potential symptoms, and it pretty much I don't see how you couldn't have had any of those symptoms um, because they're so varied. But really, it's, it, it's a virus that's taking over your, your body cells and making you, number one, replicate it, number two, transport it to other people. So it's really going to hijack our cells to make our cells replicate the virus. In the next slide, I'll talk about opinions versus facts. I've talked about this many times, but there are so many opinions people have which are greater than facts. The game of telephone, I heard this, or this happened, and it just keeps getting changed from story to story really creates a lot of problems where I heard this or someone told me that or I read this or I watched that 
So really know the facts before spreading rumors because that's really all it is. At the point of you being so far away from knowing the actual facts, the game of telephone, they're really just rumors. So one of the big things, we take information and develop our own opinions, whether they're right or wrong. So really everything is based on opinion. You take facts and determine based on your information and, and your likes or dislikes, you develop your own opinion. So whether it's right or wrong, you, you're free to have your own opinion. However, base that on facts, not what someone told you. Because there's so much with this, this issue where there's so many people trying to take advantage of others and control others. And really the key is what is the point behind this? What are they trying to obtain? And that's where you try to figure out, really see what's going on. So one reason why we've had such problems in the U.S. with COVID is our health ranking is at the bottom of most countries. We have the highest health care costs, but some of the poorest health care as well as health in the world. We have the highest levels of obesity, chronic illnesses. We have an aging society, which is taking all different types of pharmaceuticals to, to stay alive and function. So there are more people in cities, so we're having much more close contact in this country. But again, we have a lot of pre-existing conditions. And these are going to, if, if our bodies are already having issues fighting things off and, and just staying healthy, when you're hit with something like this, you're really going to have to buckle down and really focus on improving your health. And this is not something that your doctor's responsible for. It's something that you have to take seriously and do Every day you have to practice self-care. So those are important things we need to look at in this country and why it's, how it's, why it's affected us so much is because of all of our pre-existing conditions. So these are things we need to address and look at from a, you know, not only a past perspective, but also what we're looking at in the future. On the next slide, we'll talk about symptoms or having none. So either you're symptomatic or asymptomatic. So again, as I discussed before, you're going to spread before your symptoms are seen. Most people on a normal circumstance, if they're feeling sick, they're going to stay home and not go to work likely. Uh, with the viral load peaking at a certain point in time, you're also going to have highs and lows in that viral load. Now, if you're staying away from people in the first, you know, it used to be seven to 10 days, and now it's brought down to five. If you're kind of isolating that point, that should help things out. But there's an incubation period where your body is basically producing and increasing your viral load. And those are things that have been very different with this virus as opposed to other things is that you don't know you're contagious and or sick because you're not seeing these symptoms. On the next slide, we'll talk about variants. So this is something that all viruses do. It's not exclusive to COVID. So there's many mutations that are going to happen over time. And this is just a natural thing. The viruses are not smart. They're just changing over time. So we started off with alpha in 2019 and went right down the list. And currently, Omicron is the predominant type. And typically, when you're looking at the variant, the one that, that is, is the most uh, common is going to kind of predominate things. So as the virus has changed, obviously Delta was a, was a pretty strong wave, but these have been waves up and down of different types of variants. Uh, but over time, uh, like Omicron has, has been said to be more contagious, but a lot less severe. So that's one good thing is that, that it is spreading more. Hopefully people are still not letting their guard down and, and doing the things they, they need to be doing. But you're, there's a lot less hospitalization with this strain of the variant of COVID-19. So there are persistent mutations. Spike proteins do change over time. The vaccines were based on that alpha type. So when we're using vaccines even today, we're still using that alpha type trying to rely on that, those spike proteins that were used in the initial COVID. So this is something there, there has been some uh, debate where we were using the same vaccine from when it initially started to fight something that is mutated many times. So these are the main mutations, but there's lots of other small mutations away from this. So that is one of the you know, complaints against people that are against vaccination is that we're using a vaccine for a 2019 alpha variant versus a 2022 Omicron, but there would not be time 
or money or resources to create a new vaccine in this amount of time. Okay, and the, la the next slide is about long haulers. So this is something which is talked about quite a bit with COVID, but it happens with, with most illnesses and diseases to where it takes time for your body to get back to normal. Uh, there's a lot of symptoms and things from brain fog, headaches, numbness, taste and smell disorders, which don't seem to last that long, um, where people are, are you know, they feel like they've recovered, but they have some lingering issues, especially if you had some serious lung issues and you were a runner or some type of endurance athlete, it, you're not going to get back to normal really quickly. So this is something that may take some time. Uh, but there's other things after that could create uh issue in your health like COVID pneumonia. So that's one thing where people may have, may have survived COVID, but you actually get pneumonia after that, which could be very deadly if in a weakened state. So getting a secondary respir respiratory infection can be very dangerous after uh, COVID because you're already kind of weakened to that. Now, breakthrough infections are a big thing that you hear about nowadays because these are people that have been vaccinated they may have had COVID before, before or after being vaccinated, but they got COVID again. Likely that, that form of COVID is going to be much more mild. Your body can handle it more, much, le much less level of uh, hospitalization. But again, just because you're vaccinated does not mean you cannot get COVID again and doesn't mean you can't spread it. So again, you have to still take these precautions and not let your guard down. Okay, on the next slide, we'll talk about time. So this is something that, like I said in the beginning, that time has been challenging in that, number one, we learn things over time that we wish we would have maybe corrected or done differently in the past. But the other thing is we're always having these daily discoveries and that the time that, that we've had this, this outbreak has been extended because there's been a lot less people getting vaccinated, a lot less people being cautious and the spread of this is, has just been crazy. I mean, there's been waves up and down. So it's not like, oh, we're done with it and it's over. It can come back. You can, you can get it again, regardless of your situation. So there's a lot of things you just really have to take you know, your personal health very seriously. So there's ongoing studies. This is a 24 seven news cycle and everyone's pretty sick of hearing about COVID. So cases to deaths, uh, this is as of January 1st, 2022, there's 378 million cases estimated, 5.67 million deaths, which is 0.015% of confirmed cases have died. So not even 1%. Uh, the world population currently is about 7.95 billion people. 0.007% of world population have died. So way far off from 1%. Funeral homes have been overwhelmed as well as cemeteries. On the next slide, we'll talk about how big 1% is. So some of the conspiracy theorists and things like that and people that are pushing a lot of these agendas uh, have put some numbers out there, and I've actually fact-checked a lot of these numbers, and these are true. So this is some of the information I like to present and, and discuss uh, 1918, we all heard about the Spanish flu killing 50 million people. So the world population back then was 950 million people. So that killed about 5.26% of the world's population. Everyone considered it as a tragic event. Uh, so that was 5.26 is quite a lot of people dead. 2018, we had a seasonal flu where 650,000 people died worldwide. The world population was 7.5 billion. 0.009% uh, of the world's population died. So far less, but experts call that a typical year. In 2020, COVID-19 killed 488,729 people and counting. The world population is about 7.7 .7 billion. 0.006% of the world's population died. So far, far less than 1918. Um, so as experts were saying the world's coming to an end, we have to shut everything down. So 1% of the world's population would be 77 million dead, which we are far, 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 far from. Now, who knows how long, you know, what the death toll be, but I don't believe it would go anywhere near that. So 5.26% is tragic, 0.009% is a typical year. So what would we call 2019 to 2022? This is all questionable. I think the biggest thing we look at here is that because of 
all these modern advancements in science and medicine that we believe we should shut this right down. It shouldn't be an issue. But with an increasing population, more and more people being sick, chronically ill, it, it's going to affect people. But shutting everything down and, and managing things has been very difficult. There's been missteps. There's been good steps and bad steps. But the main thing is we have to really look ahead from what we've learned from this last year. The next uh, slide is just thank you for listening. So I appreciate everyone listening to this. Obviously, some people might agree, might disagree with what I've had to say, but I've tried to present things in, in a simple manner that should be easy to follow with. And uh, hopefully you've learned some things from this presentation. Again, there's two more presentations after this, part two and part three. So thank you for listening. We'll see you soon.